Zeit. Ja. Всем доброго дня. Hi everyone. I think I can I can switch to English. We have 25 participants. Wow. Um, let's wait for perhaps a minute or two in order to well, to for people to join. Um, and uh, today I want to introduce you to our amazing ambassadors and speakers, uh, Sophie and Alexandra Hi. from Yugoslavia. Um, uh, they are very enthusiastic to help us with, uh, with uh, all the expertise and knowledge that they have and even uh, agreed to make us a special workshop for our participants. So please, uh, the next hour, um, I hope will be very productive and uh, also very exciting for, for, for us to, to, uh, to reflect. And uh, I'm sure that it gives you lots of thoughts uh, to, for your new ideas uh, and the project to, to be registered till tomorrow, 27th of July, um, in our base of projects. And, uh, uh, from my side, I also can say that for now we already have uh, 100 ideas uh, in our base of projects and we still didn't close the presentation. Uh, mentors are very excited already to, 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 to check and to look and to meet the teams uh, on, 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 on Thursday. Uh, so um, I, I am giving a place to Sophie and uh, Alexandra to start this workshop. Uh, and not to take too much time and to leave it for the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. And thank you also for, for giving us this opportunity. I, I think we are equally excited uh, to be here because we are so curious what's going to go, come out of this week. Uh, in the end, both Alex, uh, who works at the Europeana Foundation, and myself working at the Belgian University, but also functioning as the vice chair of the Europeana Network Association. We are kind of the, the audience that you guys are developing and building these solutions for. So uh, each in our own right, we have been working in this sector for quite a few years. So super um, uh, curious, in fact, for what will come out of these uh, co-creative exercises. Now, what we're going to do today, uh, as we wanted to tap into our specific uh, expertise to share with you in this workshop, we're going to focus on curation and storytelling. And I believe this is a general and a global truth that you all know, a good story can sell anything. And vice versa, having a good product is not the whole point of uh, doing an exercise like this one in the hackathon, you should also be able to transfer what that product product does, what does it mean, what could it, how could it fulfill the needs of your stakeholders and your audiences. So we're going to try to um, pitch and to demonstrate some hands-on tools uh, with you. We're going to share some inside information, some tips maybe on how to optimize your curatorial and storytelling efforts. And to kick it off, I'm uh, circling back for just a second or, or two to what Europeana actually is. Europeana today is the operator of the European, the common European data space for cultural heritage. And even though it has been running since 2008, you could say that it's still um, a very young and eager and ambitious body of people uh, and institutions across, uh, across Europe who are pulling strengths, who are pulling together to make available uh, cultural collections uh, in the most comfortable, open, um enhanced and inspiring environment that we could possibly create in the digital what we also do is we support these cultural heritage institution institutions in their digital transformation and that's about so much more than just scanning objects to make them digital it's also about 
uh, co-governance, about collection management, it's about copyrights and uh, le legislation and so on. Of course, what you will mostly see on the outside as a user of the Europeana.eu platform are the millions of digital objects. They come from thousands and thousands of GLAM institutions across the continent and even beyond. And I might add to this that uh, over the past couple of years, but especially quite recently, uh, there were added some collections uh, highlighting heritage from Ukraine that both Alex and myself and many of our colleagues are very, very enthusiastic about, uh, specifically in terms of expressivity and storytelling capacity. So go and check that out, europeana.eu. Our key digital product beyond the Europeana uh, portal is a suite of APIs. And we want to mention this explicitly for you as an audience, because this might be something you might want to tap into for your project over the next couple of days. If you click the link, and uh, we can already promise to make available this presentation, if you click the link behind APIs, this will take you to a pro environment for the professionals in the field of GLAMS, where you can tap into these APIs. And I'm naming just a couple of them, the IIIF uh, APIs, the Annotation APIs, and the Europeana REST API. Apart from that, of course, all these services, tools, and data would be nothing or not much without the passionate people driving this initiative. And in fact, you are today a bit a part of that. You can become even more a part of that if you're interested by joining us in the ENA, the Network Association. Currently, we're close to having 4,000 people there from all sorts of sectors, eh? not only from culture, but also from technology, education, uh, legislation, uh, company owners, and so on, who somehow connect over this idea of digital cultural heritage collections. We organize a good number of uh, events every year, and if I can highlight one, it's the Europeana Grand Conference that takes place once a year. This year is dedicated to tech, so I think, again, uh, many among you might be interested to attend. You can follow online. It's between 10 and 12 October. Um, this con year's conference will be kind of organized or co-organized by the Europeana tech community. And I'm showing you here the overall panorama of different communities that we have within our network. Why is this exciting? Because working within a community is kind of an enhanced version of being part of an association, right? So if you're there to exchange knowledge, to really keep informed about the newest developments, if you are keen to work on smaller projects or even some longer term projects together with peers uh, from your specific field of expertise, then these communities are really the way to go. And the outcomes that they produce really leave us astonished year after year. They do fun stuff uh, with communicators, with researchers, with educators, and all that um, in, in a spirit of collaboration and, um, and solidarity. Of course, besides the people, there's the content. Uh, those of you who have checked out Europeana might have seen that there's a plethora of formats and types of heritage to be found. Anything from uh, scanned texts to sound bites to videos, a lot, a lot of images, both pictures um, or photographs and artworks and ever more important, I would say, we also have a growing collection of 3D heritage. The content is available in a plethora of languages, so both on the static pages and in many cases also uh, on the item pages and the editorials, you'll be able to digest the content in uh, a language that speaks to you. What makes Europeana kind of unique in, in its operations and its offerings? I would summarize this as authenticity, uh, attribution, and accessibility. 
authenticity because at any point of time for any digital item that is given or used in an editorial you will be able to see the catalog information coming from the source this means that the museum the archive the library the gallery that actually contributed at a certain point this item is still a presence on the item page in Europeana and allows you, and this then goes to accessibility, to immediately jump into their collection at a point that you find interesting. When it comes to attribution, it's very important to Europeana that everybody receives due credit. This means those who created not only the work of art or the photograph or the text, but also the digital object and takes care of it today in their institution gets a clear attribution. For you as a user, as a, as a visitor, it means that you also have this security, this safety uh, uh, link, in fact, with the absolute source of information. And then finally, what is more important when you're working on creative projects than knowing if you can actually use uh, the item or not for any product that you might want to commercialize or that you want might want to make publicly available well of course you need to know what is the copyright license what i found amazing about europeana we're currently there at 56.9 million objects and every single one of them has a clear rights statement that tells you what you can do with that object and what you can not uh, a special recommendation, if you go to the portal and you click the collection step in the right uh, upper corner, you enter um, kind of an, an enhanced environment in which topical pages combine digital items with um, editorial features. So if there is a theme in here that really appeals to you and you want to dive in deep, you'll be able to not only read up on it, but also immediately to dive into appropriate and relevant collections. What types of editorial are there? Well, I would say something for everyone. For those who really are eager to explore a certain topic in a multi-chapter narrative, we have our exhibitions, the blogs, are a, uh, a kind of shorter format that really zooms in also on one specific theme and tries to combine sources from across Europe um, in displaying um, records around that same theme and enhancing it with a narrative. The exhibitions I already mentioned, the galleries are really fun. They are light to digest. Um, this is so so much fun for if you have a couple of minutes to spare dive into a gallery and discover things or see things that you've never known before now i think the time has come to maybe ask you guys to join me by surfing to europeana.eu because this would allow you to try out some of the stuff that i'm going to talk about next which is first how to query and filter and then we will move on to uh, trying one of the latest features, I might call it, uh, of the Europeana website, namely the gallery builder. Let's start here uh, where we are. We, uh, by going to europeana.eu and very prominently there, you see this uh, uh, search uh, space to enter basically any term that you might think of and that you find interesting. Uh, what you could do, of course, is work with several terms. In that case, if you want a direct reference, we advise you to use the quotation marks. So this could, for instance, be if you're looking for um, Mozart and you want to uh, rule out anything that is not Wolfgang Amadeus, then you include the full name between those quotation marks. If you're a bit disappointed uh, in the number of results to choose from, what you could do, and I've done this many, many times with good results, is to take your search term and try it in different languages. As I was saying, we are 
making giant leaps now in improving our multilingualism uh, of content, but let's say we've not fully arrived yet. So it can be that searching in another language, one that is maybe relevant or appropriate to the topic that you're researching, that really might turn up some results beyond your initial search. Also think of trying the what I think is called the Boolean uh, operators. So either adding uh, the word or in capitals, if you allow the query to take on board one or another term, would you want to tone that down and you find too many results, too bulky of a, of a, a collection in front of you, then consider using the end uh, operator because it will require both of the terms or all of the terms that you specify to be somehow present in the metadata. Then, and you will see this in a minute when I go on to demo the gallery builder, there's a quite impressive amount of filters you can use. And this, this is such a handy and a practical feature. Huh? You can filter according to country of origin. You can filter according to orientation of your image, whether you want it portrait or landscape. You can search for specific um, uh, licenses. So if you only want content that you can freely reuse, then the filter is uh, the first thing you should put in place. So let's look in a minute uh, at how that works. But we do advise you by employing all of these strategies to try and get under 1,000 results. And the, re the reason for this is very pragmatic. Um, the interface on the Europeana portal displays only the first 1,000 relevant results to your query. And this could mean that some equally relevant results kind of fall off your radar simply because of numbers. So if you try to get below in the first place or you manage to somehow make facets in your search, this will only uh, improve um, the, the quality, I would say, of the results that you're getting out of this. We have more search tips. You see a link here. We'll supply you with this link afterwards and you're welcome to check them out. Now, what I would love to do right now is to take you on a live demo and I hope you can still see and follow my screen towards the Europeana portal as we are going to build a gallery. Uh, now I should tell you something about this because why would you use a gallery? Well, I think two main reasons. Either it is something that you use as a tool to gather your favorite objects in Europe Europeana because you have a plan to work with them. And this was the case for me. Uh, for about 10 years, I was a curator for many of the Europeana exhibitions, galleries, and blogs. And I found that once this gallery builder was put in place, it was, you know, it was a dream come true. Before that, I was just copy pasting links into a document, trying to keep my uh, gems and my golden finds together somehow. But now it has become much more simple. Let me initiate a search around a certain topic that I'm gonna build a gallery on. Now, Alex and I were discussing what could be a nice topic that maybe also you would want to work around. And we came up the idea with the idea of backyard heritage. It doesn't mean that you're now going to see many pictures of my backyard. Uh, we of course mean it in a, a metaphorical way. And for me, my backyard really is the city of Leuven. I've worked for the University of Leuven for 20 years. It's a fantastic uh, student uh, city that is fully immersed in university heritage. And very proudly, I can say that next year, in, uh, in two years, sorry, in 2025, we will be celebrating 600 years of University of Leuven. This brought me to thinking of, okay, what was the age in which the university emerged, very specifically the year 1425. This means Leuven in the late Middle Ages and the Gothic Age. So my gallery is going to be about 
Leuven at the time of the emergence of the university. And so the first thing I do is I go and search for Leuven, voila. And um, you already see here a wide variety of content and a couple of filters displayed here on the side. These are for me really preferential filters since you can take out the texts immediately if you like to. So let's say that I want to focus for this gallery on images rather than any other content. And as I would like to use this gallery at some point for a publication to celebrate the 600 years university, I will choose only images that have an open license. So this means they are public domain or they are CC0 labeled and I can use them uh, in whatever context I want. Now, even though I can see here some promising results, I think that in a minute I will apply different filters and add some search terms. But to be honest, I really, really love this uh, dragon here, an ornament on our university hall, which is from the Gothic era. So I'm going to add it as a first item to this new gallery. I press the plus sign and voila, here it comes. My uh, single sign, sign in um, feature that asks me to log in or either to sign up. And signing up, guys, really, it won't take you more than a minute and a half. And that is an absolute promise. In my case, I do have an account. I'm logging in. I should be taken to the same page as the one I started from, indeed. And now I will be able to jump with this image plus straight to a gallery. Okay, Leuven historical inspiration. Yes, I could pick these galleries. Eh? These are galleries that I already produced in the past. You can see that there are quite a few of them. But for the occasion, so for the um, Hatathon workshop demo, I will create a new gallery that I might perhaps briefly describe as Backyard Heritage, Leuven in the late Middle Ages. Voila. I'm keeping it private for now. I could also choose to not check it. Not checking it would allow me to dive into my gallery copy the URL that I find at the top of my, uh, my web page and share the URL with all of you so that you would see what comes out of my effort. For now, since this is work in progress, I'm keeping it private. I won't be able to share the URL, but I will be able to continue working until I find that I'm ready to share. Voila, gallery created and I close up. Now, I would like to find maybe some more of these uh, Gothic ornaments. So let me go for Leuven and Goth. I'm using here these asterisk because I would really like to find um, items that are not only Gothic, but also Gothis and also um, uh, Goth maybe without any, any suffix. So these asterisks kind of are my, my jokers, my wild, wild cards that allow for an even broader search on the topic. So what do we find here? Some similar entries. Yes, this looks like some really cute uh, devil, devilish sculptures that I'm now simply adding to my workshop demo gallery. Yes, these humanized figures are exactly what I was hoping for. Great. And although I love these images, I find them maybe to be all a bit similar. Don't you agree? So I would want some variation also in my gallery. So what I could perhaps do, as I recognize many of these images coming from my university, what I would do is maybe go to a different country and see what they are saying about Leuven in the Gothic era. Uh, not a lot of material, but let's check it out. This one from Germany. 
and click on the item to explore a little bit more what this is about. A card with a Madonna with child, uh, painted by Dirk Bouts. Indeed, he was a Leuven painter in the period of the establishment of the university. It is a public domain image, so this is definitely going into my gallery. Okay, I have a couple of items there. Now let me show you how that turns up in my account. So I now clicked my profile and will visit my private gallery since I chose to keep it private for now. And here you have it. It's like a kind of a Pinterest board, but I would say a bit more fancy and maybe even more uh, practical. You can see that I curated it, that it's private. My short description is there. My title is there. I can edit anything at any time. I can also delete this eh, after uh, when I'm maybe not happy. And very interesting, guys, the recommended items here. These might be items that you might have never found yourself. And that will be here recommended in a specific gallery. So if you revisit at different times, you might find yourself still expanding your little collection. That was it for this, uh, for this demo. So I'm hope that together with me, you're now returning to the slide deck where I want to summarize maybe what I just explained. It's simple. You visit europeana.eu and create an account or sign into an existing account. You pick your theme or the story you want to tell. You query Europeana using the search strategies that we discussed before, and you start adding items to your gallery. Pick a title and add a description, and be aware that these descriptions should be very, very, very short, eh? 180 characters. That's simply the amount that the interface allows for. And then either you decide to keep it private for you or to share it with others. I would say, and this is my final set of tips before I hand over to uh, Alex, that it's always good to keep it simple, but to find that golden angle. Eh? So in this case, I went for Leuven in a very specific era where I would try, if I would continue my search, to not only go for one specific type of heritage, but something that kind of rebuilds the cityscape of 15th century uh, Brabant. So that could be a very nice golden angle that a lot of people would find interesting. Um, an important one to keep in mind, very practical. Your gallery is constructed, uh, and this makes it different from uh, Pinterest. Your gallery is constructed um, according to the order in which you add pictures. In other words, you won't be able to change them around once your gallery gets going. Now, what I've done in the past is after my first uh, blob of uh, content was gathered, I decided to rearrange the pictures and I just did it by creating like um, a version 2.0 gallery and putting them in the right order. But it's something perhaps that you want to keep in mind already. We discussed searching in different languages. We discussed also filters and collection tabs, then keeping an eye on recommended items. And you know what? The most fun moments that I've ever had with Europeana is if you just kind of follow trails that you weren't expecting to find and dive into rabbit holes. It will really bring you to, to items and objects that maybe you wouldn't even have searched for in the first place, but that give a unique flavor to whatever story it is you are trying to uh, create or illustrate. Now, Alex, I think when it comes to storytelling, there are uh, a few people only in the Europeana ecosystem as weathered and as uh, um, insightful as you. So the next part of this workshop will dive, dive deeper into that. And for this, I give the floor to you now. Thank you. Just one quick update. Uh, 
if it's possible to reorder the items since not long ago. Ah, great. Thank in the you. gallery. So yeah, you, you don't have to like worry about that. It's just basically drag and drop. And um, yeah, I find it myself very helpful and like Absolutely. everyone um, else as well. So um, yeah, you told um, I am seasoned in storytelling, but actually I think everyone uh, is a storyteller deep inside or more on surface. What we want is to give everyone chance to express themselves through stories and to be confident about that. So um, I will present a few tips which are useful when working with European content, but also when working on all kinds of um, yeah technical projects, um, apps, maybe like you know digital uh, things that you would like to share on social media. Um, so um, they are quite universal. Um, you can uh, use them within this uh, hackathon, but also uh, for other activities. And um, yeah, I hope you'll enjoy. Uh, just wanted to know that want you to know that we do have opportunities for guest contributing to Europeana. So if you feel like writing guest blogs, um, galleries can be published just by kind of automatically or participant participate in our events like um, Digital Storytelling Festival. Um, yeah, this is possible and we'd love to, to have you. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah, I thought it was happening, Alex, and then it, yeah, it's there. It's yeah, it kind of froze, but I think it should be, it should be back. Um, yes. It's coming, not yet completely there. Yes, I yes. think it's there. So uh, those seven tips are were kind of invented with a group of people who worked across cultural heritage sector to make them kind of easily shareable and universal. So first is be personal. So actually your personality, your lived experience, um, everything you know, the way you are thinking and expressing yourself is what makes you special, but also what makes your story special. So individual stories are interesting because they are unique. There is no need to try to say something general and universal is actually the sum of different specific stories that makes it interesting. Um, it's also about us being human and sharing as humans. So of course there's Wikipedia, there are encyclopedias, books um, to check like technical information, but what is interesting for the audience is your personality and kind of human significance uh, between uh, behind the artifacts and objects. Be passionate about what you're talking about. So if you are someone emotional with a big personality, it's okay to show it because this is how you get people along uh, with you. And um, the last sub point in this, um, kind of try to sense the cultural context and your audience. So looking at the history, we know things change, the way we kind of assess and see different things, events, people change. There is part of it we cannot influence, but part of it we can. So when possible, um, check what the impact of your story on the others is or can be. The second one is about being informal, but expert. So it's important that the knowledge you're sharing is of quality. So if you have expert colleagues and you are kind of a storyteller putting the information together, give them a voice, let them talk in person. But at the same time, 
the form of it, so the language you're using, should be simple and understandable. So the more it is simple and understandable by many people of all kinds of education, ages, backgrounds, the better for you, the bigger impact and reach your story can have. Uh, if possible, not always, it's something that's possible, but if possible, avoid jargon, specialized terms, acronyms, which are can be very tricky for um, people to decipher. If you need to use this kind of complicated vocabulary, use brackets, use context to at least when they appear for the first time, explain them in a few sentences so that the next time the audience sees this term, uh, they know what it is about and they can follow. Otherwise, they have so many terms they don't understand that they will miss the point of your story. Um, if you are working on a bigger project with many contributors, of course, again, different personalities, different style, try to give guidelines which will, at the same time, be kind of a point of reference for everyone to be on the same page, produce the similar quality, length, um, type of um, contribution, but at the same time, within those limitations, this is how people can shine. When they know what they are uh, supposed to do, they can really do their best work. Um, be clear about the audience. So, um, if there are children, of course, short form, if it's online, um, should be kind of digestible. So short paragraphs, um, a lot of images. If it's um, something with narration, see if there are like, for example, subtitles, if you see that the audience might be exploring your thing without the sound, for example, on social media. And um, as long as the content is, um expert um it's well informed the format can be playful so you can play with the form to make it a little bit attractive for the audiences so the third one so um there are a lot of stories being told uh retold there are a lot of stories that will be findable in the books but there are even more that are hidden and um, the more local it is related to a specific community, specific identity, specific region, a very kind of niche activity or something that is disappearing because of how the world develops with technology, for example, or lifestyle, um, you can actually make a bigger change. So um, when you are choosing subjects, see if something that you know can be missing from more global picture because if you know and you can contribute it it will be very valuable even if you don't see it in this way because for you it's something normal for other people it will be either now or later um look for hidden gems so sometimes because of the lack of knowledge of lack of description um people don't know what is the value of an object but if you have because of your background, because of your familiarity with the subject, knowledge, and you know that this is precious, go for it and show it to the world. And uh, similarly, if you are running a project, um, it's nice to uh, look for collaborators, look for input. So if it's about cultural heritage, yeah, asking parents, grandparents, uh, looking, asking for old pictures can be something that um, will give you information you need, but also contribute to community building and kind of a sense of uh, togetherness. Illustrate your points. So, um, in the collections and with technology that we have available right now, um, it's possible to use all kinds of images, uh, either to illustrate the story, but can be also as a main focus. Um, especially when online writing, it's nice to break uh, text with an image so that people scroll and they have a, actually a little visual break. Um, 
if you have like a very high quality digitized image, to say, you know, taking a look at the different aspects and different kind of places in it and uh, looking at them separately can be quite interesting and uh, also help people take a look at the details that they probably they wouldn't notice when looking at this piece uh, in a physical form, which can be, you know, the size A4, while digitally you can zoom very closely and take advantage of the fact that every pixel almost is visible. And again, and again, because it's very important, who is your uh, target audience? Um, some people would like more visuals. As we know, some people might like videos if their attention span is uh, shorter. Some people will enjoy explanation in text and kind of illustration, which is smaller. So kind of see if you are who you are writing or creating a story for, and it can be the different versions of different iterations of the same story will look well and work for different uh, target audiences. So signpost your journey. So this is especially if you are creating something techy like uh, an app or like uh, interactive website or interactive experience. Um, this is about bringing people on the journey and uh, helping get them not get lost. Uh, so uh, having a clear sense of what's happening, what's next, uh, what's the structure, how to go next, how to go back um, is useful. And it also helps you to make sure that your story makes sense. Because if you divide it in chapters, if you uh, work on your structure, it's very easy to then see, do I need to describe it in this way? Oh, here is a big uh, chunk of text without an image. Should it be uh, one chapter or one header or more of them? Is it nice to show as a gallery that you can swipe uh, sideways? So, um, when you are kind of putting your text and whatever, or text, um, images, visuals in the platform, always think if it works for the navigation and platform you are um, having in mind and uh, which were you um, selected. Uh, it's useful also for like overall performance to uh, give clear subheadings, uh, numbers, uh, links that are visible and open in a new window so that you don't break the experience and send someone elsewhere but rather have like go to another tab this is um all useful if something that you are producing requires complexity so just there is no way it's not complex it's just like this uh consider giving a little explainer before so saying the next section is complicated. The best way to find yourself in it is to do this and that, explore it in this way, and kind of remind people on what to do so that they don't get lost. And digital makes it easy to uh, make links. So if you are all doing the hackathon and you see kind of synergies between products, activities you are organizing, interlink, make connections, because then everyone wins you be, because you have chance for more audiences to explore your content and the reader, because the journey doesn't stop for them with your story, but they have another story and other people's points of view to explore. And in this way, we all contribute to the knowledge. Be specific. So um, none of us knows everything about the world, and, but we know sometimes, like Sophie was talking about Leuven because it's her city. It's the same for each of us. We are expert and very good at something specific. 
which in a way then represents a bigger issue, problem, event, um, trend. So always start with what you know the best and then based on it, you can kind of situate it in a bigger context. Because when you just start with a bigger context, probably your story will be very similar to all the stories already published. So always think, where is my strength? Where is my expertise? Where is my uniqueness? Where is my secret sauce? And this will bring you to a story that will be appreciated by the audience, uh, but also give the focus and kind of a unique point of view that was not explored previously. And the last one, be evocative. So of course, facts are important, we all know it, um, but it doesn't have to be dry. If you are someone poetic, go for it. If you are someone artistically expressive, share your talents. If you are emotional, because what you are saying is emotional, your audience can know it. And this is a way to engage people. This is a way to be human. This is also a way to bring color and personality. So uh, use your imagination to encourage the reader, list, um, viewer to also engage their imagination. Think about all the senses. So this is um, to kind of not only think about the visual aspect, but explain, let people hear stuff, describe maybe how something smells, how something feels in touch. It's also nice for all kinds of audiences to have this information in case they have disabilities and impairments, you still give them a chance to be a part of your story. So think about this as well. Um, Evocative doesn't have to be complicated, so you don't have to go to check the dictionary to find the most special or unique words. It's more about putting a feeling and a little bit of guts to it. Uh, so these are the tips. We have them for you in Ukrainian, so I added the link um, and what you have to do. Click on it and go to the bottom of the page for a full text. And this is like an infographic. I just uh, took a piece of it, but it has all seven in this form. So it's also kind of shareable. You can send it to people, you can print it, you can hang it above your desk if you are writing uh, or creating a story and want to kind of uh, have them uh, at hand. And of course, uh, try to use them in practice. I hope uh, they will be useful. I just wanted to show you a few stories which are nice, digital, and kind of are good examples of the points are I covered. Um, so our friends from the Curation List, which is an American-based uh, service um, kind of showing and curating cultural heritage content, uh, did an Instagram story takeover with us. And it was about women's history and part of their stuff was Ukrainian. So we thought it was a great idea to um, present some stories about Ukrainian embroidery as a part of kind of women's activity. So as you see, it was for Instagram story. Instagram story is viewed for like one second tops. So there cannot be too much text, this one sentence that you really want to explain the most important thing but it's visually pleasing, it's colorful. So these are textiles from Europeana with some additional images. Uh, we wanted to keep it colorful, light, of course, put the sticker so that people can then click through to another place when they see similar content in, uh, in a way that is, doesn't disappear in one second, doesn't uh, continue. And um, it's basically one sentence text, but still uh, shows uh, contributions of women, of Ukrainian women to kind of crafts and uh, art making. 
So another one is a video. I don't think we have that much time to show it, but just to give you an example. So this is a video about a profession of a water carrier. That is a profession that doesn't exist. Uh, but someone used the cultural heritage collections, created a narrative and an animation to kind of show how this job looks like. So if you have something like this, you know, an activity, a profession, um, a celebration maybe that is disappearing, consider making a little video using all kinds of materials that you can around it. Because I said, as I said before, it can be very precious and it can be something that is reasonably unknown. And as the time passes, the value of the story that you put together will increase because it, it will be even more rare and special at this time. And to circle back to the gallery making. So this is a story, this is a story created based on a mood board from a gallery. So it's a fictional story that someone wrote to explain a specific time in history. So it was about a uh, queer um, community, um, but she actually started from looking through collections and kind of thinking what, the main character of my story looks like, how the setting is, and you kind of see that even if it's just the mood board, you see this triangle shape, you see like the mood of images, which is kind of very artful in itself. And um, this person who is a participant of our online creative residency, she will create for every letter of LGBTQA. Uh, she will create this fictional story with a mood board. So if you are into fiction writing, collections can also kind of help you with finding the flair, also finding ideas, but also specifying on how your characters uh, places objects could look like from a specific time. So that was it. Uh, time for uh, Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, we have already, uh, there are a few smaller um, uh, questions in the chat that I believe uh, we addressed and you did also, Alex, uh, throughout the session. But two larger ones uh, are emerging now um, in, the, in the past couple of minutes. The first was asked by Veronica, who wants to know if there are programs, uh, for instance, corporations or grants for the Ukrainian creative sector on Europeana. Uh, what I wanted to maybe say here first in response, Veronica, are a couple of the things that we have been um, doing over the past, it's, it's already a couple of, of years, but we're trying to ever intensify. Uh, one thing would be that we are collaborating with the European Commission on the Laptops for Ukraine campaign. Eh? You might know this, it has been running for a while, but in May, they opened uh, a specific tab in this uh, campaign for the Ukrainian cultural heritage sector. So I can tell you that at this very moment, a pipeline is being made from uh, European uh, hubs that are collecting tablets, laptops, scanners, any sort of digitization equipment to be distributed among Ukrainian heritage institutions. This is one thing. The second thing is that we have established a working group on Ukraine within the network association and the aggregators and the foundation. So it's really a, a whole initiative wide um, uh, thing where we come together with people really passionate in exploring ways to be of support. And so we would be interested, I think, with this group to hear any ideas that you might have 
on what is needed in the sector, because I think that is where it should start for us, for our efforts, not trying to, um, to come up with solutions that maybe uh, are not really responding to the true problems and the true needs, but addressing the needs as you encounter them in your, in your daily activities. So we would be very, very grateful to hear from you on this. Maybe one final thing, uh, Alex, to mention here are the editorial grants. Would you like to, to go into that? Yeah, so uh, we indeed do have uh, editorial grants and um, it's a way to provide content to write a, a guest blog, for example, that we publish on our uh, website and uh, receive uh, a grant for it. So at the moment it's open for everyone. So it's not specific for um, Ukrainian cultural heritage uh, sector, but of course the members of uh, Ukrainian cultural heritage sector are very uh, welcome to apply. In the future, we might um, do, do it more specific if you think this is something that would help you, this is a good moment to raise it because then we spread the word. We say, hey, this is actually something that would help Ukrainian cultural heritage professionals and Ukrainian culture to flourish and be better. So if you think editorial grant, especially for Ukrainian um, cultural heritage would be something useful, let us know now. Uh, jumping, uh, I see Anna, you have a, a hand raised, but I first want to pick uh, one more question from the chat and I will combine it with an earlier question because Halina is asking us, even if it is dangerous to reduce the text to one sentence, it is a simplification which may not contribute to the development of our service recipients. And I believe uh, Halina that you are alluding here specifically to the galleries where I said that the description should be quite short and no longer than 180 characters. I'm gonna combine this, Alex, with a, an earlier question about whether or not it's possible to embed galleries in, uh, in an external um, online environment. Because indeed, Alina, we, we limit the description of uh, galleries to a very short, short amount of text, because it's kind of uh, crucial and critical for the flavor of this specific editorial that the, the ratio text images is, let's say, uh, puts the maximum of emphasis on visual impact, right? So the storytelling that happens here through the title and the short description is uh, an evocative one, an inspirational one, is um, a triggering one, asking people to, to look, to get inspired, to explore, to become curious. So let's say it's inherent to this specific uh, editorial. Would you want to um, provide a different ratio between uh, text and image? Then for instance, working on a blog could be a better option. Uh, Alex, what about this embedding of galleries? So first thing, whether it's uh, dangerous when you tell a story to reduce something to one sentence. Yes, it is dangerous and um, reducing anything to one sentence can be dangerous and bring the results you don't want. Uh, but it's your responsibility as a curator to make sure you make it safe. And uh, ab about embedding galleries. So uh, at the moment, I think as embedding as a kind of box, I think we are working on it. But for sure, uh, you can link a gallery within a wider text. Or what is also um, maybe interesting is show a couple of images and say, if you want to see more of this type of images, um, you can see the whole gallery and then there is a whole selection. So for, with material, for example, so just textile, which is a little bit repetitive, but for someone especially interesting, interested in this topic, it might be worth showing more. Um, again, uh, you can show a sample and invite to explore further. 
the other way around um, within the time and within the space you have you can always make the best of the sentence that you do have and let uh, people explore the rest because the short form is not only use, useful for galleries, it's useful for social media, it's useful for video captions. So being able to communicate in simple, short, but powerful sentences is a skill that is very useful. Yes, and let's not forget a proverb that says, uh, in der Beschränkung zeigt sich der Meister. So if you're able to really make get things to the essence and to the minimum, that's basically where true mastery of a subject and of a story are, are shown. So we could also see it as a challenge to ourselves as curators and storytellers. We are conscious of time, guys. We also, I think both of us need to run to a next meeting. Before I give the floor to Anna, because she has been raising her hand for a long time, I I want to say that we are here for any follow-up questions, suggestions, uh, ideas uh, that you might have. Uh, we even, we also propose to Anastasia if there would be a group among you who would be interesting interested in uh, diving a little bit deeper with us in these topics, we can set up something at a, at a later stage, uh, even beyond the competition. So it's up to you to, to drop us a note. You'll find our email addresses at the end of the slide deck and to, to just let us know what's on your mind. Eh? Now, Anna, you seem to have been disappearing yeah, now. Uh, thank you so much for this lecture and attention to storytelling because somehow we often focus on digitization without telling the story and it's not that important. And perhaps then I will save time and try to contact you directly because what I think there are lots of interesting digital initiatives already existent in Ukraine, but they are not present on Europeana. We work on one project and we try to make it combinable from the very beginning and upload in future on Europeana. So maybe somehow we should think on a campaign to attract attention and to make Ukrainian art and stories and more visible and present on Europeana, some kind of cooperation, not not a program needed for that just like people driven by yeah. passion as you and said just, uh, for you to kind of be aware of so every year in may we organize a digital storytelling festival where mm -hmm. we present all kinds of uh storytelling projects um ideas we have all kinds of speakers so i think this is a very easy opportunity to get involved so if you have a story a project you would like to share and speak about with quite a big audience, I think we had 440 people joining sessions this uh, year from across the world, uh, very enthusiastic, drop me a line, I dropped a link to the presentation in it, mine and Sophie's emails are there, if you write us something we will yeah let you know, but we'll also keep you posted in the coming months on our activities on how to get involved. It would be great. Yeah, thank you so much. So we'll stay in touch. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Anna. Um, all others among you who are wrestling with pressing matters or questions, please, please do reach out. Um, I'm afraid it's time to move on now, but not without sincerely thanking you for being here, sticking here with us, for your interest, your enthusiasm and the interaction. And now it remains for us to wish you all the good luck with your projects and we'll see you hopefully in the final on Sunday night where we'll, we will be awarding a special uh, Europeana Digital Heritage nomination to one of the 10 finalists. And for everyone techie, uh, please join the conference uh, in October. Online is free and you're all welcome to join all the sessions. See you, everybody. Thanks yeah. a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. Alexandra. Bye. Have a good evening.